Law 529, Section 9, Lecture 2. Okay, in our previous lecture, what we have looked at is actually looking at uh, general relevancy provision in Section 9. Basically, under Section 9, in our previous discussion, we understand that evidence relevant under Section 9 can be separated into five category, category of relevance. That is, facts to explain or introduce facts and issue or relevant facts. Facts to support or rebut inferences suggested by facts and issue or relevant fact. We have discussed in our last lecture, we are talking about evidence relevant to fixed time or place in which facts and issue or relevant fact happened and the one that occurred relationship of party. So today we are going to look at evidence that show identification. Now under section 9, it only says that evidence to show identification. When you talk about identification, you are talking about identification of thing. This is where you are producing the real physical evidence which could be the subject matter of the facts and issue. Say for example, you are tendering a knife. Yeah? So you are tendering it to be, for it to be marked as an exhibit. It will be tendering of real physical evidence. <coughs> and the other one would be identification of identity. It can either be identity of the person. So when you talk about identity of a person, it can either be the accused person, the victim, or a relevant third party. So this will basically be <coughs> generally evidence establishing identity. You have identity of persons, so be it a victim, accused person, or relevant third party. This one have to be proven by evidence in the court. So you may have evidence of identity of a person. Maybe someone give visual identification of the victim. Maybe you have the doctor who conduct the post-mortem on the victim. So identify the victim. So you have the accused person or any relevant third party. And just now, as I told you just now, you have evidence that shows things which could be the subject matter of the facts and issue. For example, you are tendering the drug. So someone has to testify on the drug, confirming the substance is actually a drug. Katakala, an accused person was caught with white powdery substance in his possession. This white powdery substance need to be sent to the chemist. Katakala, you have chemist Dr. K analyzing the substance, found it to be heroin. So Dr. K here is going to testify in the court and his testimony will relate to the identification of the subject matter of the facts and issue, which is the drug. And for, because he is testifying in the court as an expert, his evidence has to be accompanied by section 45. He has to be an expert. And another one will be evidence of thing also when you are talking about real physical evidence. Is for example, you are tendering the knife or you are tendering the, the gun and the bullet. So you have example there in the case of Rudy and in the case of Datuk Motahashim. What happened here is that you are producing an evidence of the bullet which was discovered from the body of the victim. So you have someone who are an expert in ballistic to give evidence of the fact that that particular bullet comes from this particular gun. So that one requires an expert under section 45. Now, there are several methods of identification that you are talking about with regards to proving of identification. The concern will be identification of a person. So we, it could be photograph identification, fingerprint identification, DNA, voice identification, CCTV identification, as well as facial identification. Now, the most problematic method of identification is actually visual identification. So, I will explain to you later why visual identification is most problematic, right? So, in the meantime, in this context of the lecture here, we are going to discuss other forms of establishment of identification except for visual identification. Okay. <clears throat> now, let's look at evidence of identification. Now, the first kind of identification, so you have identification here of a person. Remember, when you talk about the person, it can either be the victim, the accused person, or a relevant third party. And out of this identification, the most important one will be the victim. You have to identify the victim. And another one more, very, very important, will be identification of the accused person. Basically, you have to identify the accused person. The accused person has to be placed at the scene of the crime committing the actus reus. 
So that's why identification of the accused person is very, very important. So we are going to look at this lecture, identification. So we have several kinds of identification. The first one will be identification uh, through fingerprint. So you have fingerprint identification. You have identification through the photograph. Right? You have identification of the DNA. You have identification using smell. So you identify a person by virtue of his smell. You have uh, basically CCTV identification. You identification a person through a CCTV. And the other one will be maybe identification by voice. So you can identify a person by voice identification. Right? There are so many, many other things <coughs> of forms of identification. But the one that we are going to discuss here is going to, going, is going to be only this part. Yeah? Right? This discussion also can you, you can find it in the book. Now, when you talk about identification by fingerprint, right? So, maknanya, what you have here is that you are retrieving the fingerprint from the scene of the crime. So, it's either by... Uh, so, what you got to do here, you retrieve the fingerprint at the scene of the crime and what you do, maybe you will do some comparison of fingerprint identification. So, you may have the accused person actual identification and the fingerprint identification which you retrieve from the scene of the crime scene of the crime you compare that now in that kind of situation you may not require an expert to give evidence in the court but sometimes evidence of identification can require an expert yeah, to give evidence in the court especially when you are dealing with a uh, kind of uh, complicated evidence of identification basically if you refer to uh, let's look at section all right you've got to refer to uh, maybe section so this one is actually signature uh, is there anyone in uh, nothing here yeah? requirement of section okay you refer to section 45 now if you read section 45 here opinion of that persons when relevant subsection 1 when the cause has to form an opinion upon a, for, a point of foreign law or of science or art, or as to identity or genuineness of handwriting or finger impressions. The opinion upon that point of person specially skilled in that foreign law, science or art, or in questions as to the identity or genuineness of handwriting or finger impression are relevant facts. So it means that when you talk about evidence of identification, there will be in some instances where you require an expert. Right? You require an expert where you have here the expert is giving evidence in the court and the court will consider the opinion of an expert so it's going to be the form of opinion evidence and the court will either use that opinion or not and one of it will be evidence of identification through the fingerprint yeah there can be situation where if you have you are dealing with evidence of fingerprint impression then section 45 will be there yeah? There's a need for you to have section 45 as well. Mananya, the one who testified on the fingerprint will be an expert. Now, when you talk about evidence of fingerprint, the authority that you can refer to will be the case of To Ki Huat, whereby what happened in this case is that, right, this person was actually charged for stealing a car and his fingerprint was found at the inner window of the car right of the car so what happened here is that according to the case of Tio Ki Huan right so the evidence of fingerprint which was found in the car could be evidence of occasion cause effect and the identification and he the accused person here is to be identified as the person who attempted to commit that uh, the, the thief of theft of a car. So his fingerprint in the case of Toki Huan was tended as evidence to show identification that the person was actually attempting to do that. Yeah. And basically, when you refer to the case of um, fingerprint identification, yeah, according to the case of Om Prakash, yeah, the case of Om Prakash. 
The evidence of fingerprint identification has reached the degree of exactitude. Now, what does it mean? It means that if a person's ident uh, if a person's fingerprint is found at the scene of the crime, that fingerprints belong to the person has reached a level of exactitude, meaning to say that the science has already established that that fingerprints belong to that person. This is because you have to understand the nature of fingerprint is that it has to be, so fingerprint identification is actually unique. Now it's unique in a sense that there is no one single person in the world have shared dia punya fingerprint. Maknanya kita punya fingerprint, even though we may have an identical twin, we may have different fingerprint identification. So this is the only form of identification that is unique. Whereas when you talk about DNA, you compare that with the DNA. Evidence of DNA, a person can share a DNA. So katakanlah you have, okay, DNA is also a form of identification. If you have uh, an identical twin, you have to understand how an identical twin exists. So what happened here is that when you have identical twin is where you have one sperm fertilizing one ovum. So did I fertilize? Lepas tu, the fertilized egg split into two. That's why you may have a twin here. This is an identical twin. They does not only share the same feature, they also share the same DNA. Yeah, also share the same DNA. Yeah. So this is where you have fingerprint, sorry, DNA identification. But when you talk about the fingerprint identification, it has reached the level of exactitude because it has been proven that one person can only have one unique fingerprint identification. So that's why you have fingerprint identification. Okay? Now the second form of identification is actually by way of voice identification. Right? You have it by way of voice identification. An example of voice identification, you can actually look at it from the case of uh, Tem Kam, Tem Kam Seng. You also can look at the case of Daud bin Ahmad. Now, what happened in the case of Daud bin Ahmad is that you have the accused person here is having problem of relationship with the ex-wife. So, they were divorced. So, now, there was a court order restraining the accused person here from meeting the wife because he is very abusive. Now, what happened in this case is that on the night in which the wife was found murdered, the wife was actually telling the daughter, you have the daughter here who is, who is your prosecution witness. The wife was telling the doctor, alright, I'm going to meet your father outside, you just stay here. And what happened here is that the daughter was actually in the house listening to the voice of the father, accused person and the wife, they were quarreling. And eventually, maybe they went somewhere and the wife did not go home. So the accused person is now being charged for the murder of the wife and the evidence that you are producing here will be the evidence of the daughter here who did not actually see the man but give evidence of the voice identification of the father. So she basically testifying to court the fact that yes, I heard the voice of my father, I heard he was with my mother prior to the death and you are putting the, the father here at the scene of the crime or at least to be the person who was last seen to with your mum. So this is the evidence of voice identification. Alright, that will be one example. So the daughter can be called to give evidence in the court. Yeah, another case will be the case of Tang Kam Seng. Yeah, this is where you have the accused person here commit uh, extortion. So he extorted money from three victims. So you have victim one, victim two and victim number three. So he extorted money from them. So you basically have all of the victim here is giving evidence of voice identification of the accused person which transpired via the telephone call. So all of them is giving evidence of voice identification. And the court says that yes, you can, provided that caution is actually being invoked. So the court has to treat the evidence of the victim here with caution when establishing the identity of the accused person. So maknanya in this sense, voice identification has been accepted as evidence in the court. Okay? Now let's look at the photo identification. So you're talking about the photo uh, identification through the photograph. 
right? So identification through the photograph, the issue now is when you have photograph identification. The law says that you, when can you show photograph? The issue here is that when can you show photograph? So you basically have a photograph of a person. When can the identification of photograph here can be tended as evidence in the court? The photograph can be an evidence of identification if the photograph is used to assist arrest. Yeah, so you're showing a photograph. The show of photograph is actually to assist arrest. It means that, right, the showing of photograph to the witness must be before arrest to assist arrest. Yeah, it has to be before arrest to assist arrest. So if you have, basically, this is actually provided for in the case of lie a cam. So if you have the prosecution witness here, so the prosecution witness katakanlah has been assaulted dekat Taman Tasik, Shah Alam. Right? This particular person has been uh, assaulted. So what happened here is that, right, the police officer have shown photographs of three individuals. Right? The showing of photograph of three individuals to PW here. So P, out of the three person here, the accused person has identified person number A3. So as a result of the identification of the of the person A3 here, the police go to the to A3 and catch him. So they tangkap dan and interrogate him for the for the for the offense of sexual assault katakan that happened at taman tasik sya alam now if if the showing of photograph is actually given before arrest to assist arrest then the showing of photograph can be relevant and admissible so the law the photograph cannot be used to give to, cannot be used as evidence in the court if it is for the purpose of after arrest maknanya you dah tangkap accused person tu you show the photograph. The law say you cannot do that. So that would be number one. So when do you use the photograph? Yeah, as a form of identification. Now number two, when you talk about photograph identification, the first one will be the question is when. Yeah. Number two here is that the how. Yeah, the how question. So if you are showing photograph to the accused person, right? The case of Girdari Lal, yeah, Girdari Lal says that the showing of photograph must be clean from anything that is prejudicial on the accused person. What happened in the case of Girdari Lal is that the photograph of the accused person here has the police number. Yeah, if you recall, if you watch the the, the movie or whatever dekat dalam TV. You have photograph identification, you have the photograph depan, belakang, kiri, kanan, semua. And you have the police number there. That photograph indicate that the accused person here is a criminal. So if the photograph here has any indication that the accused person could possibly be a criminal or have bad character. So this photograph is not relevant, not admissible because it's going to be highly prejudicial. This is what happened in the case of Girdari Lal. Okay, you got that? So this is what you talk about when you when you show photograph. Maknanya, you are going to tender photograph identification as evidence in the court. The first requirement is that it has to be shown before arrest to assist the, the police to, to, to effect arrest. And number two, there must be no indication of identification. So there must be no indication of something of bad character or criminal nature that can link to the accused person which can be highly prejudicial. So you have to bear that in mind. Now, having said that, there can be situation where, right, the show of photograph is after arrest. And I think it can discuss this one when we discuss about visual identification. So in, the, in this part, you got to see yeah, the use of photograph only before arrest to, uh, to assist arrest. Okay? Now let's look at your next okay your next point. So you have basically we have discussed by fingerprint identification, voice identification, photograph identification. Now 
You are tendering evidence of DNA identification. Right? So when you talk about DNA identification, of course, the DNA identification has been regarded as one of the ways in which you can establish identification and it is one of the most effective ways. The technology of DNA identification, kalau kat Malaysia, uh, in 1990s, when I did my, uh, my degree, it is still in the early process of uh, the coming or the accepting of DNA identification. So, kalau kat Malaysia, towards the end, pertengahan 1990-an is the time when DNA identification was used as evidence in the court. Now, when you talk about DNA identification, the case of Duru Vendar Vendren, yeah, the case of Duru Vendren, basically has accepted that DNA identification is rather conclusive, right? Yeah, as I told you just now, you basically have to use technology here. So you retrieve DNA from the accused person or the victim. You go to under. You have to go. You have to undergo the process of some scientific evaluation. You must done processing and then. You akan keluar daripada mesin itu some kind of a chart that can reflect the composition of the punya DNA and because of this particular charts, requirement of section 45 has to be there. Maknanya, a person who can give evidence of DNA identification has to be an expert. Yeah, has to be an expert. Yeah. The use of DNA identification was, uh, it has been used largely been used you have the case of Ahmad Najib Aris that used DNA identification basically what happened in the case of Ahmad Najib Aris right you have the DNA of the victim yaitu Kenny Ong was found on the pants yeah of the accused person right which was taken dekat rumah dia so basically of course the girl has been raped and murdered and dia punya DNA ataupun uh, was retrieved from the pants of the accused person, right? And then, of course, you have the remember the case of Anwar Ibrahim, Sodomitu, right? So you also have the DNA of Anwar Ibrahim and the DNA of so uh, Saiful were taken as evidence in the court. Of course, they have been challenged to it, but uh, the evidence of DNA was used to place the accused person to be at the scene of the crime or committing the crime. So basically, DNA identification is also very very important. Right, so you have that DNA identification. Maknanya, if yeah, remember you may produce this particular document. So you may have the DNA report here, tended as evidence in the court. So if you have DNA report, so you are producing a document. This document is going to be computer print up automatically. Kalau you nak produce that particular computer print up, section 90A will be relevant. And section 61, 62, this is primary evidence. Yeah, computer print out are regarded as primary evidence. Yeah, bear in mind, you've got to look at the question. If is the question asking about the relevancy of your prosecution witness who are an expert, ataupun are you talking about the document that you produce? If the question is very clearly says about the expert testifying orally in the court, tidak ada issue 90A, 61, 62. But if you're talking about the document that is being produced here, this one will be relevant. Yeah? And of course, you have the case of Ahmad Najib Aris, yeah? relating to uh, Section 90A. Okay, so that will be all DNA. Okay, another one. Okay, you have uh, evidence of smell, identification of smell. Example of a case that can relate to with regards to identification of smell here, you can have it uh, from the case of basically in case uh, Hanif Basri. Right? You have Hanif Basri. Now, what happened in the case of Hanif Basri here? Uh, the existence of evidence of smell, peculiar smell, which was, which was um, smelled by the witnesses. There are two witnesses here in this case. This witnesses basically says that the person who rushed from the house leaving the condominium who could be the last person, who could be the one killing uh, Norita, having some kind of peculiar smell. Yeah? So this person, the smelly bukan smell Hanif Basri, this is not Hanif Basri smell. 
and the evidence of these witnesses upon identify, identifying the smell of the person not belong to Anya Bansri managed to raise reasonable doubt of the fact that there could be someone else beside Hanif Basri who was there at the scene of the crime that could have killing, that could have killed uh, Norita Samsudin. So you have the identification of smell. Alright? Okay. One more point. So we are talking about the last one here is the identification of through the CCTV. Now, identification through the CCTV, of course, recall, you recall the case of uh, the Mahatta face, so you basically have the CCTV here capturing the image of the accused person lurking the dorm to pukul 2-3 pagi. So, you freeze that, you freeze the uh, CCTV, you put it into a form of photograph, so you are giving evidence of photograph could be could be evidence of photograph it could also be evidence of cctv identification right so you are tendering the here the cctv ident cctv uh, identification of the accused person now now when you tender evidence of cctv identification the kind of identification that you are tendering here is regarded as a real evidence because CCTV here is going to capture an ongoing image as and when it happens, right? So you are tendering the evidence of CCTV here while upon the other documentary evidence, therefore it falls under the definition of documentary evidence under section 3. It is a computer evidence under section 3, but the kind of evidence that you are tendering here will be a real evidence of identification. It's like a one-to-one -one confrontation. And when you tender CCTV identification, according to the case of Ahmad Najib Ares, right? Bear in mind, this case has gone up until the federal court. You have to comply with Section 90A. Now, Section 90A, if you recall, Section 90A is either you produce a witness who can testify that the CCTV is in good working order and running is operation in the ordinary course of business. So CCTV must be in good working order. And the CCTV here is actually running in the ordinary course of its use. Yeah? So you have a witness here testifying orally. So the requirement to call the witness here will be the requirement under section 90A. So it's either you call the witness or alternatively under section 90A, you can produce a certificate of a person who man ataupun manage that particular that particular CCTV to say that the CCTV is in good good working order and that CCTV is running in the course uh, in the course of ordinary use so it's either you produce a CCTV you uh, either you produce a witness or you produce a certificate confirming that. Now, which one is most, uh, which one is the best? Yeah, basically, if you can produce a certificate, it's going to be the best because you don't have to call a witness because the moment you call a witness, this particular witness here will have to undergo the process of examination in chief, cross, and re-examination. And they can, be, they can be situation where this particular witness may do some blunder to your case. So the best is if you can produce a certificate that will be the best. Yeah? But sometimes the, the person the company may not want to produce a certificate to say that it's in good working order, then there's no alternative that you have to call the witness. This was what happened in the case of uh, in the case of um Susila Wati, yeah? So in the case of Susila Wati, yeah, what happened here is that the prosecutor want to bring evidence of the uh, telephone, their cell phone record, right? The cell phone record as to their location. Yeah, kat mana dia orang punya location? What they do is that they got to triangulate uh, dia punya reception of the cell, uh, cell phone daripada the victim here. So, what they did was that the prosecutor basically called witnesses daripada DG, daripada TM, daripada tu to confirm the operation of the of the cell, cell phone 
macam mana dia transmit data so basically the information in the cell phone record reflect that and you are calling witnesses orally in the court similarly in the case of Hanafi Mat Hassan yeah Hanafi Mat Hassan you have bus ticket yeah you have bus ticket in this case so the instead of producing certificate under section 90A they call the person who operates that bus so this person managed to give evidence in the court as to how the operate the ticket bus work ya yeah? the maksudnya masuk slot kat situ dia akan link dengan accused person dengan bus tu dia punya route dia so many things ya yeah? so that is what happen ya yeah? if you have CCTV because the moment you tender CCTV as evidence in the court you are basically producing documentary evidence computer evidence 90A automatically be complied with and this kind of evidence will be primary evidence under section 61 62 so it's actually a primary evidence so cctv babe, therefore is a relevant evidence to show evidence of identification now when you talk about evidence of cctv here there can be situation where failure to produce the cctv could be fatal in some cases Look at the case of C. Kak Chuan. Right? C. Kak Chuan reflect the importance of you tendering the CCTV. Otherwise, otherwise presumption of section 114G can be invoked yeah, if you fail to produce the CCTV. However, sometimes you may have CCTV but the production of CCTV need not necessarily be compulsory at all times. Remember, it will be depending on the prosecutor to determine whether or not to produce a CCTV TV or not. Because it is the privilege of the prosecutor to produce evidence to prove his case. So, dalam si Kek Chuan, failure to produce CCTV was regarded, regarded to be fatal. Yeah, Adverse inference was invoked and it, has, it becomes a gone case for the prosecutor. However, in the case of uh, Hasbi, yeah, in the case of Hasbi, as well as in the case of Akbar Ali, right? Failure to produce CCTV is not fatal because the gap that was created by the CCTV was filled in by persons who gave direct evidence of identification in the court. So you got to look at the facts of your case to see whether the tendering of CCTV is, uh, is wanted by the prosecutor or not, right? And in some cases, maybe it become fatal in some cases it may not be fatal yeah it depends on your in your on your facts okay now so what we have discussed so far right is evidence of identification right and we have looked at identification through the photograph fingerprint dna voice identification cctv identification and the one 